Geschenk. Na, ja, klopp, ja. Ajetsek videonere marel vor ter koordinatyuna chi khankaremets ter videoner nan maretsek hajik underwater? I know, what is that? We should probably mute. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> We're live. 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 We're Te vanklerem bir diye lan beri posak tutunu, uremin yes bir diye pohem vanklereni. Eliz. Hello everybody. Et Erik Hakopyan'ın Zoom'u direkt ima meeting'i meş ozmaz lesez, batım böyle lesez. Hacetek ter videonere yev adyonere marel. Hacetek Hakopyan'ın Ayastan mit aran, eta organizare. Hacetek ter videon yev adyon marel. Ter posak tutunu gıkhankare, yev naev ter şarjumner gıkhankaren. Yeah. Okay. So today we are glad to have Eric Hagopian with us. However, just before we start, I would like to say a few words about ARPA Institute. ARPA Institute has been around since 1992, 28 years now. And we work mainly in Armenia. And these events are the only ones that we organize outside of Armenia. Our activities are with the institutes, with the universities, and with the government. And we are composed of experts from all fields. And we try to, pre uh, to provide consultation, advice, and sometimes assistance in developing different areas of Armenia. We have pro programs with the uh, institutes uh, of the Academy of Sciences. We have programs with the universities and also we work with the government. Our latest activities include developing the first and only clean room in the Alejandria National Lab to have more research, scientific research in advanced areas. We also provide various scientific instrumentation to the institutes and the universities for them to carry out modern research. We have created the first and modern blood bank in Yerevan, in Armenia, and also the first life, uh, health education and lifestyle program for students. And we continue doing various programs. You can read about our activities in our website, arpainstitute.org. Now, I'd like to introduce Today's moderator, it is one of our board members, Dr. Ani Shabazian. Dr. Shabazian is an accomplished scientist, educator. She has a mass, two master's degrees, one from Harvard, one from uh, UCLA, and her PhD is also from UCLA in urban schooling. And she's trained internationally in Budapest, Hungary, Regio Emilia, Italy, and has pursued a passion for becoming a committed global educator, helping elevate the lives of vulnerable children globally. She now holds a dual appointment 
at the Loyola Marymount University and serves as both the tenured professor at Loyola Marymount University School of Education and as the director of children's centers. Ani has authored several books and also peer-reviewed articles and continuously presents in conferences internationally and nationally. Ani, the floor is yours. Good morning and to, good evening to those of you tuning in from Armenia, including our speaker. We have suffered perhaps the greatest defeat since the genocide. And we did it at a time where many of us thought that we were secure in the gains we had achieved following the independence from the Soviet Union. Many of us are in shock or feeling the after effects of being shocked by the awfulness uh, that was visited upon the people of Artsakh. So now we are forced to reassess from the bottom up what went wrong and what needs to be done so that we may move forward with as much security and co confidence as is possible. I would like to thank the ARPA Institute for featuring this conversation with Eric Hagopian. Even during some of our darkest hours, the ARPA Institute continues through their steadfast work in Armenia to serve as a steady reminder for us all that we can move forward from another dark chapter in our history where Armenians survive and claim their rightful place to live peacefully as a nation in this world. Our objective with our time here today with Eric is to share some of the thinking about our current post-war state, focusing on the economic, political, sociocultural, military consequences and implications of the war. Um, I look forward to us listening closely and engaging with our speaker. I would like to give voice to you. And so I will ask a series of questions as the interviewer to address what I would like to think the audience would like to hear. And what I don't address, I will devote some time for the audience to do so by writing their questions in the chat box towards the end. And so let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker here today. Eric Hagopian is a 30 year veteran of American politics, having worked on campaigns from the local to the presidential level. For the past 22 years, he has been the principal at EDH and Associates, a Southern California-based Democratic consulting firm. In, 19, in 2017, Eric moved to Armenia and has been living there ever since. Thank you for your time here today, Eric. It's a pleasure. So I'm going to start with just contextualizing. I'm a history major, so I'd love to just contextualize a little bit of the history of Armenia. And we'll start with very easy questions. From a historical perspective, one that predates the origins of the Soviet Union and up to the 1991 conflict, how would you describe the dynamic of the relationship between the Azeris and Armenians? Well, uh, first of all, I want to make uh, one thing clear, which I told some of our other moderators. In, in our initial uh, uh, invitation, uh, I was listed as a PhD. I'm not a PhD. I'm not... Uh, Finally educated like you are. So I just want to clarify yeah. that for the record. Uh, the second thing is uh, to answer your question, it's as worse as it's ever been. Uh, uh, I think, but realistically, uh, it's driven, frankly, by the other side. There has been a systematic 30 year campaign uh, of nearly brainwashing in making your average Azeri hate Armenians, hate Armenian ness to the extent that I think. There's an element of their national identity that is based on hatred of Armenians. It's almost uh, part of the zeitgeist of the culture, which I think feeds into some of the savagery that we've seen. So uh, the relationship has never been worse. Uh, and it's been planned to be the worst ever and not, not inclined towards reconciliation of any kind from their side. And obviously, what that has meant and the experience of the war is uh, there's two things that uh, clearly are over here. One of them is there's no peace camp here in the sense that uh, no one's going to fly to Tiflisi to some conference paid for by the EU to meet as areas that are for peace because there's about three of them. <laughs> uh, and the entire pro-Western camp here has collapsed. There's no such thing. Even diasporans who are from 
the United States are either hostile to the West or indifferent to it. Mm -hmm. And that's the result of the war. So the entire political understanding, uh, September 26th, uh, Hayastan was probably one of the most pro-Western places in this part of the world. Uh, if you do a poll right now, uh, two countries that'll come up on top, it'll be Russia and then Iran and then dropping dramatically down other countries. Yeah. So uh, that's what's, to answer your question, I think that's that should cover it as far as the first question goes. Okay. So Armenia came out on top of the 1990s war, but those mm -hmm. gains have now clearly been reversed. Mm -hmm. We now see clearly that the Azeris had been preparing for quite some time, their capacity to confront Armenia and Artsakh. Was Armenia preparing to meet the Azeri buildup? If so, how? If not, what was the impediment? First of all, there's two issues here. The Azeris were preparing for war for 25 years, but the catalyst for this war and the decision maker was not Azerbaijan and it was not Aliyev, uh, it was Erdogan. You take the Turkish factor out of this war, one, the results are dramatically different. Many of you knew there were these clashes in July in Tavush in which the Azeri military was humiliated. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what happened after that is he essentially uh, Aliyev turned the car keys to his country and his military to the Turks. The entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were fighting against the NATO command, against thousands of Turkish special forces, uh, obviously all the terrorists and uh, murderers that they brought with them, special forces from other countries, uh, and very sophisticated uh, drone systems that were devastating for good parts of the war, even though there was a period in the middle of the war that we had somewhat solved that issue in some ways. Uh, so the Azeris were preparing for this for 25 years, but frankly, they were not capable of doing so. Uh, if this war would have, if it was just them, this war probably would have ended with that first ceasefire on the 10th. Uh, but the primary decision maker was always Erdogan. Uh, and that was the primary difference. The Azeri military itself is not dramatically any more effective than it was in July, except with much better command that had much better results. And they obviously have superior weapons. But one thing that is one thing that has become clear is that our military, all the dysfunctions of the state that we've had in other fronts that we thought the military was exempt from, clearly the military was not exempt from it. Uh, the military performance uh, when it came to logistics uh, and other factors uh, was very poor. Uh, all the Indian, I mean, we don't know enough about the war to have concrete opinions. Again, if, if anybody, you know, tells you, oh, this is what happened. And yeah. that, we don't know that. We don't know that. But just from the anecdotal things that we know, uh, we know that this was supposed to be a three, this, this, this war plan of theirs was three or four days. It was supposed to, they were supposed to get to Shushi in three days and they were supposed to get to Rabhan, enter Armenia and his checkmate. They never got to Rapan and it took them 44 days to get to Shushi. And the primary thing that held them back was, and the, 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 most, the most incredible bravery of, uh, of essentially enlist and uh, draft these soldiers. What we have found out, and this is uniform, is that despite the fact that we don't know most things about the war, the one thing that we do know is the best part of the army were the 18, 19 year old, 19 year old conscripts, mm -hmm. which is sad. They should not be the best part of the army. And so it was the incredible heroism of these kids that kept this war going and prevented even worse outcomes. But there was systematic, dramatic failures. The army was not up to par, and it was certainly not up to par to fight a well-led NATO command army uh, with better weapons, more of it, and some of the things are frankly quite uh, irresponsible. Like, I mean, you, you take the issue of drones. This is not new, yeah. you know? Drones, uh, since Barack Obama became president in 09, he was using drones left and right to kill people left and right all over the world. So we had this whole military command who sat in their big offices and they over 10 years never thought that this could actually visit us someday. Uh, 
I mean, it's 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 astounding, astoundingly stupid uh, that they would never prepare for this, knowing that it's going to come, knowing that it was done to us in '16 in much smaller scale in the '16 war. Uh, but what drove the defeat? You know, outside of poor command and and a lot of things we'll find out about the military that. But you know the, the the root of it, or the herinak, as they say in Armenian, is uh, 20, 25 years of systematic corruption. So you would say that it's that corruption or the lack of economic capacity. More it's so a than lack of economic it. capacity, and uh, I mean, let's put things in perspective, just in raw, raw terms. Again, I think there's many, many things one can be critical of the current government. That's not even an issue. They are responsible for this result. They're not responsible for the entirety of the result, but they, they share some of the responsibility, especially in their neglect of foreign policy since they came to power. Uh, however, since this government came to power, you know, we're, our, uh, we're, our budget has gone from you know, a little over $2 billion a year to $3.5 billion a year. Mm -hmm. So just by doing regular tax collection and not having the oligarchs get away with murder, you're collecting a billion dollars a year. Now you amortize that over 10 years uh, and you say you're gonna devote 30% of that to the military. We have a completely different outcome. Uh, so yes, we, we paid the price for 20 years, 25 years of incompetence, theft, corruption, and uh, thievery. Uh, and the country didn't develop in the way it's supposed to. And, you know, there was an element of this, that this, this war was a black swan event in many ways, Re regardless of all of our failings and the military failings, this war would not have been possible six months ago. It would not be possible six months from now for various different reasons. Mm -hmm. Europe would not be as distracted with the, uh, with the virus. The United States would not be in the mess that it has been for the last few years. Uh, as far as being totally disengaged. So this was a black swan moment that showed essentially our system fragility, mm -hmm. which highlighted how things can fail. And then when you look at it critically, you know, uh, it's not just in Armenia, but worldwide, you know, our, our institutions are mediocrities everywhere. You know, even in the diaspora, you know, we have to be honest about that. Right. And we, weren't, we weren't up to par. Uh, on so many levels. So this was, this showed and highlighted this whole systematic failure on all levels. Uh, but if you're going to point your finger to something, I mean, you know, you get it from, uh, you know, uh, you know, taxi drivers will tell you a lot. And sometimes they tell you the mm -hmm. truth. And you, you drive by one of the big oligarchs houses, you know, they'll always point to it and say, you know, this is where our drones are. Oh. People understand that. Powerful. Yeah. So the lack of economic capacity, would you say also coupled with a bit of over-liberalize on Russia, both for defense and economics, is what led? Uh, no, it's just a lack of economic capacity. I think we have to be very careful about uh, the over on in Russia is, is a matter of it because you have lack of economic capacity. It's because right. with agreements with them, you get to buy weapons a lot cheaper. And we also have to be careful because some of the Russian weapon systems are actually fairly good. Uh, if you get the current versions and not the 1990s versions that we were having, okay? Uh, some of the Russian systems when it comes to anti-tank and all that are actually world-class because we had successes in the war. You know, we essentially destroyed their armor corps. Uh, five, 600 tanks. I mean, it was like, it was a turkey shoot in some of these places. And and, and, and frankly, uh, one of the military attaches that I spoke to joked that in, with the advantages that the other side had in 44 days, they should have been in Rome and not Shushi. Mm. Uh, and, and, and part of it was, you know, uh, we, we, our guys played pretty reasonable defense for, a, for as long as they could. Yeah. Uh, so I think we want, we want to be careful with this Russian thing because the Russian thing is a function of poor economic outcomes. Not just because Russian, I mean, there are things that the Russians are not good at, you know, but that's that's not the driving. For. We if we had, you know, uh, if we had modern weapons, we would have done better than not having. The Russian factor is it's a it's a, it's it, it's a factor, but it's not. You can't just blame saying, oh, you know, Western weapons are superior to that, because you, if you have 90 systems fighting modern systems in any system, you know, the modern one wins in capacity and range and things of like that nature. Right.
If you had to take a guess, an educated guesstimate, how much do you think Armenia has invested in its defense industry since 1996? Oh, you're talking about industry or you're talking about the military? Those are two different things. The, mil about like the military. I mean, your average, uh, I think on an average, before the revolution, I think it was somewhere in the four to $500 million a year range. After the revolution, they bumped that up probably by $100, $200 million. Uh, so you're, you're looking at, you know, it's just an imbalance of like, you know, four to five to one. But sometimes people read too much into that because, you know, the Azeri spent $20 billion on defense on, on their military. But the most effective things were the things that they spent the least amount of money on. Drones are cheap. They're actually quite cheap. They're not expensive. Hmm. You know, some of the, you know, one of the best, uh, you know, uh, drones in the world is the U.S. Predator drone. It only costs three and a half million dollars. You buy any fighter, you're looking at 30 to 100 million dollars. Hmm. So military spending in and of itself does not, uh, does not predict outcome. You know, the Saudis spend $50 billion a year on defense and they're utterly competent and they can't, you know, they can't defeat some rebels in Yemen with AK 47s. So, military spending in and of itself does not give you a quality military. But, you know, there's, if there's enough of an imbalance in a situation like this, in a war like this, yeah, of course it has an effect. It would be foolish not to believe that. Okay, so now looking at the economy, how do you think the current war will impact the Armenian um, economy? Um, obviously, to build a thriving Ar Ar Armenia, we will need financial investments. What would you advise the government to do to stimulate growth after the war? Well, I'm not, well first of all, I'm not, I'm not an economist, so I think right. my, my, my guesses would be somewhat pedestrian. But I think, uh, first of all, let's turn the clock back to 2019. We were actually in a good place before COVID. Right. Uh, 2019, Armenia had the highest growth rate in Europe, period. It was Armenia and then Poland next. And we had three years of, you know, I think it was like six, 7% in 2017, 4% to So we were for, those are darn good numbers. Exactly. And they were primarily driven by serve, the service sector. Uh, they weren't even driven by foreign investment because there's, there's never been tremendous amounts of foreign investment here anyway. And, uh, you know, there's a few sectors of our economy that are actually very, very well run or actually very good. The service sector, especially sort of the, uh, the, the one that's related to online services and things of that nature is exceptionally good and growing and actually employing a lot of people. And uh, you know, I, I, I would tell you in, in many instances, it's better than what's in LA. I could just tell you that as far as the quality of the service sector. Uh, then you have a very robust banking sector uh, you can just see it in the fact that we've gone through COVID and we've gone through a war and the drama has depreciated 3%, which is ridiculous for a developing country. So we have a very competent central bank uh, and a banking system that is actually pretty solid. Uh, and lastly is the tech sector that constantly keeps growing, which is a, it's an area of innovation. And we've actually moved from just being an outsourcing site to a startup site. You actually have one or two startups that are, you know, world class, but you know these are the exceptions to the rule. So uh, I think, after all, Armenia does not. The whole world is in a recession, depression type situation, given the country, except in one or two places like China and like really exceptional places. So I think as the world economy pulls out, the US, the Armenian economy will improve. Uh, I think tourism, if it picks up in any way this summer, will be quite helpful even though I, I think you're going to have, I don't think that industry comes back in a full way for a couple of years anywhere, to be honest. I uh, but I, I think in the short run, you know, you literally need to invest in things that create jobs. It's sort of like, it's more of a, you know, social democratic yes. approach rather than anything else. Because one of the things that's happened is we've had, you know, much better tax collection so you already have built up, so you've already gotten rid of a lot of the in, informal sectors of the economy. I think the informal sectors of the economy are in that 15 to 20% range, which are actually pretty good because even in a place like the United States, you never really go above 90 because yeah. someone selling strawberries on the side of the road is gonna sell strawberries on the side of the road everywhere. Exactly. So, uh, you know, that's, that's that on that front. Uh, but I think uh, it's, 
as the world comes out of recession, will come out of recession. Um, but I think uh, this is the key thing, uh, and especially for people from the outside that want to engage, is mm -hmm. we need to be focused on excellence, okay? There are some words that need to be eliminated from our language. Yolaketank needs to be eliminated. Oh, Hayastana needs to be eliminated. We have to focus on excellence and focus on the areas of economy or services that are excellent and support them. And in most of these fronts, we're failing. And this is the truth. You know, uh, we don't have a single university. It's a top 500, probably not even a top thousand in the world. Uh, we don't have a single medical center that it would be any kind of a specialist place that people will come from other countries, despite the fact that if you go around the world, we probably have top-notch Armenian doctors. You put them on one building, they'll probably, you know, it'll be the greatest hospital ever. You know, there's so many failings that we have. Uh, and, but I, I think it's important for us to understand is you need to invest in excellence. You need to support excellence and engage in excellence and not accept third rate mediocrity. And if you look at our political leadership, you look at our military performance our military industrial complex, it's all mediocre. I mean, there are stories that I'm not even going to, I mean, stories that I hear from the war, I'm not going to share them because I don't, it's not very, it's not verified by, right. you know, essentially in a scholarly manner. It's this, this person's word that I trust, but it's, you can't talk about that because it's not verified. They could very well be wrong. Mm -hmm. There's so many idiotic decisions that were made during the war that you hear about that makes you scratch your head. Like who, who was what? Uh, you know, uh, there's this great Israeli saying that I like is when someone is really stupid, they'll go, he's so stupid, he could be a general. Uh, those are ours, you know? Uh, so we had, the, the higher you went on the command, uh, the worse the quality became. And the lower you went on the command, the better they were. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it's a total system failure. We have quality people being led by people that aren't worthy of leading them. Uh, so we need to we need to learn from this. You know, we need to admit defeat, figure out where we're at. And one of the, one of the things that everybody agrees with in this, in this, I mean, you can talk to everybody from the mother that's got a 13 year old who's gonna have a son in the army in five years to the taxi driver, to an intellectual, to Ruben Vartanian or a billionaire or other kinds. They all will say, we need to build a military industrial complex. And that needs to be part of our industrialization plan. And, and what the brains are here. And the brains are here. The future of warfare is in robotics, actually, not even drones. And there's a lot of people working on these lines and talking, people with money and resources. But there's a consensus that we that, that we cannot go through this again, ever again, in which we have to rely on this person to open their air window or this person to do us a favor to get weapons in this country. And if you actually built this military industrial complex, you can actually create your scientific field again, uh, which is critical, and be able to defend yourself uh, in the most modern weapons and actually industrialize certain parts of this economy again. That's one of the things, I mean, there's a couple of things that have, people have come out of this uh, war with that are like gospel. Everyone believes them and they're gonna act on them. And this is one of them. And what are, I know you're not an economist, but you're so overarching in your knowledge about so much depth and breadth. What are some possible sources of the revenue that you speak of? Revenue as far as investments? Yeah. I mean, listen, there's uh, the one, you know, the world is full of Armenians with money from the strangest places, you know, from Brazil yeah. to Russia. I mean, there, you see people here like, uh, you know, there's some creative industries in California that you just use your imagination uh you know they let's say they smoke a lot you know they're here doing things they were here during the war because you know that <laughs> that industry is dominated by armenians so if i were to tell you the cast of characters that were here during the war you could it'll be like uh you know something out of like casablanca ah yeah <laughs> so Do you see now a little bit about the demographics so do you see investors leaving? Um, what are the demographic implications of this war, both on the generation that fought, on the possibility of increased immigration, on the overall psyche of the people? I mean, for the younger generation, this was their first encounter with war. For the older, it was their second. First one having been considered victorious, and this one a major loss. 
with war and terrorism. Jeffrey, it, it's, uh, the immigration issue is something that's gonna sort itself out over the next couple of years, because frankly, even if you want to leave the country, there's no place to go. The whole world's a mess. And it's not like you're gonna go anywhere and make yourself any better. I don't see that as the, as the primary issue. The one thing that's going to come out of this thing is, first of all, you know, because of Armenia's peculiarities in its economy, growth here has never really been on like the traditional third world model where, you know, someone builds a billion dollar factory. It doesn't work like that anyway. It's a lot of small things, you know, uh, you like outsourcing firms, back office stuff, uh, phone banking. I mean, there's just so many things you don't even know about. Uh, there's this whole uh, back office stuff from Europe where like people go to sleep there and then all the back office stuff gets done here, you know, uh, and for local salaries, you know, uh, someone makes seven, eight hundred dollars That's a very good salary in Armenia, especially given how cheap it is to live here. So uh, there's a lot of small things. It's not too many big things that are happening there. But I think we need to, uh, this generation that went to war, there's a history behind this and every conflict uh, any big conflict that sort of uh, stamps that generation, that, 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 that class of soldiers that comes back and there's going to be 50,000 of them and most people survive war, as horrible as it is, uh, they're going to transform this country. Uh, because they are, they firsthand saw what incompetence and failure looks like. Uh, and they have infinite credibility. And frankly, they're so much more articulate and bright than our political class. You just need to listen to them, to the videos that they do, the stuff that they put up. They're so much more mature, so much more sophisticated, despite the fact that they all look like kids. Right. But they're, all, they're kids that became men through horrendous situations. And they saw their friends get blown to bits. And this generation uh, will transform this country uh because they have seen its failures firsthand and you you hear that and they are they are considered universally as heroes uh in the way that they fought and the way that they approach things uh so people have a tendency to look at all of these things you know and it's like in a, in an entirely negative manner and but you know things are dialectic in nature you know out of good things bad things come out of bad things good things come right so uh, we have to look at it as an opportunity and not just uh, not just as a uh, negative. One of the most interesting things that I've picked up from talking to psychologists and things, and it appears like we're going to have far less of a PT, less of a PTSD issue than other countries from the, all the initial analysis. And there's very complicated reasons for it. Essentially, the more uh, the more people think that you had no choice but to fight and the worthiness of your cause make this makes the PTSD far less prevalent. And there's a lot of precedence for it in other countries and other conflicts, which is actually, you know, the only good news that we've had since the war ended. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question. That does answer my question and then some. Okay, so that was a better narrative than I had thought about. So I'm excited about that. Um, but now going back to, or starting the leadership question, um, Prime Minister Pashinyan is bearing the responsibility for the outcome of this war, and there are calls for him to resign as he is the one sitting in the seat of power at a time of loss, you know, the losing of the war. How would you describe, and you did so briefly when you talked about the taxation, but how would you describe his two-year term as PM, and what would his resignation offer, if anything? I think it's a domestic success, foreign policy failure. Okay. And that would be the two years. I mean, there's no other way to, there's no, I mean, this war is a disaster. And frankly, in any other situation, you have a result like this, even if it's not entirely his fault. Now, one of the things I can tell you is, uh, and this really makes me angry. You know, we get these generals, the whole press conferences every day. And, you know, they blame this person, that person. And I, I don't have any problems blaming other people. But first, take your responsibility. I then you blame you. half the world. You, uh, and... Uh, one thing that I one thing that I used to get, I was in the civil net offices. So these war cars, I mean, there's a lot of people involved in the war that were in and out of these offices. And they would always say, well, you know, Nicole is a he's a journalist, he's not micromanaging the war. Uh, and then after the war, uh, he's micromanaging the war. Well, which one is it? 
Was he making all the decisions or he wasn't making all the decisions? Now, obviously, he, was, he had a role in making a lot of the decisions or many of the decisions, but uh, you can't have it both ways. Uh, I think the only reason that he is in power is because uh, the opposition is inept, incompetent, and not trusted by people. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that formal opposition, the formal opposition, you know, when people see that on the street are former, what what is called here, the uh, the Armenian Republican Party, that old guard that ran the country for twenty years, people don't want them back. It doesn't mean that they don't want Nikol to go. They just don't want them back. And it got so absurd that last two Sundays ago, not this two Sundays ago, Hehehe actually put out a statement telling people we want Pashinyan to go, but we're not going to come back. Then the, what's the what's the point of the opposition if you're saying the guy needs to go, but we're not coming back? Then who's going to run the country? The janitor from across the street? I mean, it's like this absurdist situation in which uh, you have to, you know, you have the resistible force versus the movable object. Uh, Pashinyan should have been gone after this result. But people will take a, a not competent government at this point over a corrupt one, because if they see that, and I think that that first night that uh, that sort of display of going into the parliament and beating up the right. speaker and right. sitting there and taking selfies, they literally lost every teacher, accountant, every middle class person in this country, uh, because uh, they just gave this bad image of what they, people have gone through for 20 years of this talkocracy. Okay. Uh, so Eric, any, yes, you mentioned ahead. something I wanted to follow up on because there is, you touched upon something that there is this rumor going around that, you know, through the grapevine that Pashinyan was given um, a pr better deal and he was lied to by his generals a week prior. Um, is there truth to that? or is uh, it Everybody, about every story like that should be considered a lie okay. by everybody because everyone's lying to cover themselves. Got it. Then there's the opposite that he had a better chance to. And I'll tell you where, you, where I'm skeptical about all of these things. Now, mm -hmm. our guys uh, in totality are entirely capable of effing everything up, okay? And making <laughs> bad decisions. They don't, they don't need any help with that. And we yeah. don't need a conspiracy to know that. However, Pashinyan could have talked to Putin. Putin could have talked to Pashinyan. None of these people have ultimate power, okay? They don't make all the decisions. The war and the continuation of the war was driven by one person and one person alone, and that was Erdogan. You know, the Azeris would go sit there, negotiate something, and then Erdogan would say, you have to go on. So all of these things could have been true. He could have promised something. He could have been lied to. Putin could have told him this. Putin, Pashinyan, Aleyev were not the decision makers on the continuing this war. It was Erdogan. Okay. So, all of um, these things could be true, right. but they could also be irrelevant. Right. I just wanted to put some, exactly, I wanted you to state that actually, but um, in thinking about what you just said, I agree we don't have control over that, but what we do have control over, would you agree that with regard to Nikol Pashinyan's continued premiership, would you agree that some reckless speeches and policies over the last couple of years have aggravated the situation Absolutely. and that there will be some reckoning for him, but that the real reckoning is with the policy in Armenia over the preceding 20 years when Armenia held on to its war gains and it didn't take the opportunity to negotiate from a position of strength? That's what we No, 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 no. I think, I, think, I, think this is, I think you're wrong there. Okay. Let's, yeah. I mean, listen, let's go through the history. There were two places where you could have had a breakthrough. 2001, Key West, Kocharyan offered. Right. All the occupied territories, Karabakh was independent. There's a road through Rapan from Nakhchivan and Azerbaijan. Deal is done. Old man Aleyev accepts it, flies back to Baku, gets talked out of it. Okay? So Armenia was willing to make the deal and give everything up for that, which would have been, that would have been the most ideal deal. 2011, Ser Sarkisian in Kazan essentially does the same deal without the road, except it wasn't even full independence, you would get some mid-level of autonomy or, or like some not defined final independence, but a, a, a legal status that was in between full independence and uh, it, it just some middle level that would put a stamp on this place being different in exchange for all the occupied territories. The, the, the party that has said no is always the other side. It's mm -hmm. never been us through corrupt governments, through good governments, bad governments. That's never been the case. Our side has always been willing to make a deal. So I think we need to be very careful with this. 
And you don't even have to like or dislike any of these people, but those are the facts. It's the other side. The other side's position is they want Karabakh back without Armenians. Let's just be honest about that. That's their ultimate position. Now, can they achieve that? Probably not. But they came close to achieving it until the Russian interference on that fateful night or day or miserable night or day. Did Pashinyan do stupid things like make provocative speeches? We need to start a new format. Yeah, he did. He should have never done any of those things. But do I believe that that what that's necessarily what led to the war? If there was no COVID, for example, there was these other sort of these black swan lineup wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Politicians saying stupid things is a daily occurrence, okay? And he <laughs> is quite capable of saying stupid things. I live things. in America, I know, yeah. No. yeah and and, and so, so is Aliyev. And the kind of <laughs> things that he says, and then they translate it and put it in English, is ridiculous. So Pashinyan did not take foreign policy seriously. He said things that he upset the apple cart unnecessarily. You don't need to go to uh, uh, Artach and say, Miuchun, Miuchun. You already have Miuchun. What the hell is the point of saying it anyway? So all of those things are legitimate criticisms, but they're not necessarily the driving factor. Right. So that's what we need, to, we need to be careful with. Does he need to be condemned for it? Absolutely, but he could have done all these things and if the world was in, the, in its norm, none of this could have happened. Exactly. Or it could have happened on a far smaller scale. Exactly. Okay, great, terrific. I, um, now we're gonna get a little bit more geopolitical. So. We now bear witness to reality many had not anticipated. That is, Turkey would risk expanding its direct military influence into the Caucasus in an area that many believed was Russia's backyard and therefore free of any other powers' direct influences. How do you see the geopolitical realities facing the Caucasus and Armenia in particular with the introduction of well, Turkey so openly in the region? Well, there's two things with that. One is uh, certainly that's the case. It's, it's no longer, Russia does not call all the shots in this area anymore. Period. That's 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 certainly the case because back in the day, when Levrov was one of the great yes. diplomats, no matter what you think of him, and the yes. Azeri, and the Azeri uh, foreign minister is a joke, frankly. Not that ours are ours are confident, <laughs> but, not, but they're they're at least real diplomats, and this guy always looks like the guy who didn't do his homework and he has to talk to the teacher. <laughs> uh, uh, and Turkey is a player here. And obviously, this has their handprints on it, uh, which has upset the apple cart with both the Russians and the Iranians. However, let's be frank about this. Turkey did all of the heavy lifting. And if you read the document that ceasefire, in the last minute, Aliyev threw Erdogan under the bus. They got nothing out of this. There's no Turkish peacekeepers in Karabakh. All they get is some stupid office an hour away from Karabakh where they're gonna sit and drink tea with the Russians as the Russians have already violated every single part of this agreement. Instead of having 2000 troops there, they have 14,000 troops. 12,000 of them are, are listed as nurses and teachers and construction workers and half a dozen different things. They have moved in every kind of imaginable weapon that's not on the list. Yeah. anti yeah. systems, long-term artillery, anti-aircraft systems. Uh, so, you know, Erdogan did all of this, but he got nothing out of it except to highlight his weapons industry, which will be profitable. And he's actually quite frustrated. And then you see it in some of the things that they do about talking about they're going to settle terrorists there and all the silly, stupid things that they talk about. So he, in the last minute, Aleyev threw him under the bus, which is actually quite fascinating. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, uh, Aleyev is just as this whole notion of these two countries being the same, same culture. Now that, you know, that's all fine and well until the doors close. Mm -hmm. And Aleyev is, uh, one of the things that happened during the war, which people missed is the Turks systematically got rid of all the Russian related generals from the Azeri command. Mm -hmm. You get rid of all the Russian related generals. It means you're getting a lot of the FSB related generals. FSB is Russian intelligence. Okay, uh, there's generals in this part of the world that have dual citizenship, Armenian, Russian, Azeri, Russian, you know. Uh, so the Russians didn't take kindly to that. Uh, and Aliyev knows that, but guess what? If you get rid of the Russian generals and you bring in generals that are put in, brought in by the Turks, guess who they listen to? Uh, and if you are a dictator like Aliyev, 
who owns this country uh, that happens to come with some people uh, is what's your worst nightmare is that you're going to wake up one morning and there's going to be tanks in front of your palace. Uh, do you really want all those generals to be taking orders from Erdogan? I don't think so. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people using each other. And uh, Aleyev, one of the prices that he paid for this was that he's brought in two powers that can be quite problematic for any country, right into the heart of his country. Uh, the Azeris were always proud of the fact that there was not a single Russian boot in their, on their country. Now, there's big, huge Russian boot in their country uh, who will never leave. I can just tell you this five-year mm -hmm. stuff is fantasy. Uh, they will leave 500 years from now. Uh, and the Turks can be just as problematic when he had his own country that he was running without any foreign interference or very limited foreign interference. So he paid a, in the long term, he could regret this. In the short term, he was the big winner. Uh, but uh, the other thing, which this is people miss this, on that night when he signed that ceasefire, and he was so happy and he wanted right, machine and humiliated. But think about what he signed. If you're signing something that allows peacekeepers to come in and separate a part of your territory that you claim is yours from another part of your territory that is yours, is what it, are you really saying? Right. Uh, can you see uh, the United States signing something that takes a part of Arizona and says this part will be guarded by Mexican troops, but it's still part of the United States? Right. So on that fateful, horrendous night for us, that night, as horrendous as it was, for us could be the beginning of some form of recognition for Azov. Right. And it could be the first signal of them giving that yeah. piece of land away as giving it a separate designation because the moment you allow peacekeepers... Uh, you're saying that there's some differentiation there. So this, is, this was no consolation on that horrible night. But when you look back at it, uh, that's a huge concession exactly. uh, for him to make. And uh, so, and he's, he's got these two problems. You have to know how the Russians act in these parts of the world. You know, when the Russians are in Abkhazia, for example, in Georgia, yeah. uh, they move borders. Right. Every, every month, every year, Abkhazia expands by a mile or two. And the Georgians can't do anything about it. They take the border post and they move it. Crimea. Yeah. Uh, and then so uh, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated, you know, five, five dimensional chess here. Right. And uh, some of the winners and losers might not be known for many years to come. And we're good at playing chess, so I have optimistic hopes for that. How about um, along those lines, how realistic are Turkey's ambitions over the this, over this strategic corridor with Azerbaijan? Well, there's two things with that. Uh, first of all, there's this road that they want, this fantastic road that they see it as this pan-Turkish thing where you know, they get to uh, you know, go through and go to Central Asia and all that. Frankly, all of that is silliness because that road exists through multiple different countries. So what the hell does it make if it exists here? If you go through Georgia or Russia, you right. still get to the exactly. so some, of this, some of this is just stupidity. However, just from a matter of rhetoric, this is very important for them, which is fine by me. We should be fine by us, to be honest with you. The more roads and networks there are, that road will guarantee that they will not, that road is a lot more important to them than the Lachin road is to, you know, to them. So that's a trade that they'll make any heartbeat. If they need to say, okay, that Lachin uh, Hayastan corridor should always be open uh, and we get the other road, uh, they'll take the other road in a heartbeat. Mm. So that's, that's one part of it. The other thing is this Turkish, this whole neo-Ottoman stuff, frankly, it's just a bunch of nonsense, to be honest. Uh, he has the problem with Erdogan at the end of the day, he has an economy that is six months to a year to a year and a half into some kind of a crisis or collapse. They have tremendous debts. Their, their currency has devaluated by 300% over the last couple of years, like close to 35, 40% just this year. Uh, they have a per capita, per capita income of $11,000. To put things in perspective, Argentina is 13,000, Greece is 20,000. You cannot have these Chinese type ambitions with an Argentine type economy. They will eventually cancel each other out. So there's all this nonsensical dream where he's, you know, he's going to free Kashmir, he's going to capture Jerusalem. This is all fantasy that will eventually collapse in the face of a country yeah. that is an economic basket case. You cannot be a, a regional player 
with an economy that's a basket case, unless you want to turn yourself into the Sunni Iran and you cut yourself off entirely from the world. So you have an independent foreign policy, but at the pace of impoverishing your people. Yeah, excellent, okay. Thank you, that completely addresses it. So just going back to Armenia's positionality now, does Armenia have long-term the economic, political, military capacity to sustain its territory and protect Armenians over the long run? And further, what, what do we have to do to have a qualitative military and political capacity to really confront not only Azerbaijan, but like you're saying, Turkey and other interested actors now in the region going forward? Well, I mean, listen, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a, a country this small, no matter how well you do, you know, uh, if Singapore gets invaded by China, it's a very functional place, but it will lose. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so you have to, uh, you, you have to balance yourself off. You have to have relationships with everyone, which one thing that we found out when the war started that we had relationships with almost no one that mattered, just in elementary things, you know, you, uh, I think, a month before this war started, the UAE, which is actually right. quite a significant military power in the area, they bombed uh, Turkish bases in Libya. Do you think our foreign minister went there? No. He probably didn't even think about going there. Uh, did he go to Saudi Arabia, who hates Turkey, and they, they, go, they give away money like candy to efforts like this? Did he go there? No. He probably didn't even think about it. So we have to be much, 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 much better in everything there's no place, there's no area in foreign policy, military policy, or economic policy that we, we can be uh, mediocre at. So yes, listen, first and foremost, what this country needs is time. You need, you know, 10 years, five years, five years is too short. You need 10 years of sort of non-corrupt government and peace. Uh, if you were to tell me today, and you were to tell most people in Armenia today that this Russian unhappy peace that is that we have right now holds in any way for the next 10 years, people will take that in a heartbeat with all the losses, with all the terribleness that's going on. Because this country cannot afford another war. We're not ready for one. Uh, and the country needs time to develop because things were moving in the right direction prior to uh, this COVID disaster that's you know messed up the whole world and this war. We simply need to go back to that yes. and make the progress that we were making while understanding that our military was not that good, that we have complete system failure, and we need to pick up our game. We need to become better at everything. Nation. Everything, everything needs to get better, and our diaspora needs to get better. You know, our, uh, you know I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Okay, you, you take this, uh, let's say Armenia Fund last year. Forget about this year. What did they raise? $10, $15 million? Let me put things in perspective. I will guarantee you that Armenians from Southern California drop $50 million in Las Vegas every weekend. That's a thousand Armenians spending $1,500. You mm -hmm. cannot tell me there's not a thousand Armenians in Vegas losing $1,500 a weekend. Okay, you know, and we, we have such absurd pride in ourselves. And let me give you another example. Isn't it systemic? I mean, isn't it like you were speaking about well, the corruption? And so there's also fears, not necessarily in Armenia Fund, but we have heard questioning of that lately, but just in where the money goes once it hits Armenia. Okay. Do you know what's the most corrupt country in surveys every year? No. China. Oh. Okay. Yes. Corruption. It's, it's three countries, China, Nigeria, Azerbaijan. They always like do one, two, and three. In fact, there's always this joke that they bribe to win it. <laughs> uh, so corruption in and of itself is not an indicator of you're going to have growth or not okay that's 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 part of it uh i think from the diaspora perspective is none of our diaspora institutions have still adjusted to the fact that the most important thing that armenia is not a social club it's a country okay we're still running our institutions like it's the, it's a, it's a, it's the it's the club in Tehran or Burbank or, or Beirut and you need to build state capacity and state capacity is not going to happen in uh, 10 50 million dollars ranges okay is armenia fund well run hell if i know are they really bad at pr yes they're horrendous at pr but we i mean i'll give you another example and this is you know 
a community that's far poorer, far smaller than us. The, 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 the global Shia diaspora, which is in Africa and in South America mostly, is diamond traders and grocery store right. owners pretty much. It's estimated that every year they give a quarter billion dollars for the social arm of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Okay, this is the Shia diaspora from Lebanon, which is actually the poorest part of Lebanon, you know, as far as, you know, income goes. So you put that scale, you compare that to what we can do, and it's a joke. And so this cannot just fall on, oh, you know, Armenia is this, Armenia is, yeah, Armenia's got a million problems. But don't look in the mirror first before we go around, you know, throwing accusations about this or that. Our institutions are not designed to build a country. Uh, I mean, I get so many emails about this, uh, and I don't, I don't mean to begrudge anyone because we all gave to it. Armenia Fund raised $150 million, and people are like wondering how come, how come this went to, some of it went to the government. Well, who, was there? who else is it going to go to? You know, my uncle? I mean, that's who's running and paying for the war. Uh, and put things in perspective, this war costs 30 to $40 million a day, Okay. You think, you think about that in a country of a con context of a country with a three and a half billion dollar budget. We spent a billion two or a billion four on this war. That's a third of our budget. So people need to have some scale of understanding. And if you look at the diaspora, we don't approach things like that. Uh, we, it's like the social club mentality. You have to be focused on systematically building a country. Uh, which is like a tie, a, like a 10%, like the Jewish coffee. Uh, has however you do it, however you do it, it doesn't have to be Armenia fun. And you know, you could be, I'm not saying this or that. All I'm saying is you need to pick your little corner. You need to pick your little corner to create a little corner of excellence. Okay. Can I, I agree. I completely agree. But can I push back a little bit on the nation building? Sure. Front to, sure. could we, my dad had this thing when I would sit down on the ground and I'd reach up for him to pick me up and he'd say, no, Ani, you've got to push yourself down and get up on your own. How much yeah. of our failure is looking outward as opposed to looking inward and nation building from within? Oh, and from the Armenia perspective? From our perspective, yeah. I, I'm not getting, I'm not understanding. You're talking so about- like How much of our weakness comes from relying on exterior help as opposed oh, to- in, in Armenia itself? Yeah. Listen, uh, People don't have, uh, it's most of, most of the help that people get in this country that comes from the diaspora is essentially from their, you know, from their relatives that go to work in Russia or United States or someplace. So this is right. not this notion that people wait and that, that unfortunately the diaspora impact in Armenia, as much as there are individuals that do a tremendous amount of work is limited. Mm -hmm. It's limited for countless different reasons. It's mostly focused on charity and we're past charity, okay? I mean, now we're back into being needing charity, but for the most part, you need to focus on development, you need to focus on jobs. The most important thing is not to uh, send money here, is send work here. Now there's plenty of, now that in, this, in the current scheme, you know, I was on a show and uh, I said, send work here. And I hooked up two people to do, you know, graphics and other things. There's so many people here. There's so much of this work that could be done here. Send work here. Don't send money here, send work. People don't want to hand out. Uh, it's not, uh, and I'm telling you, and I, I keep saying this, younger generation of people here are world-class. Whatever you can get done in Paris or London, if someone is on the better end of their skill set, you'll get something as good, if not better. And, and I do this myself. I'm not even saying something I'm not doing. I get, I get, you know, my production work done here. Right. And uh, it's, you know, now, I mean, there's a lot of because of social media, you know, your content level has to expand by like four or five times. And you do something that, that, that in Los Angeles will cost you $10,000, it will cost you $2,000 here. So yeah. you have to look at niches, you know, work with people here, give them work, send them work. Yes. If they're up to par, by the way, and if they're not up to par, don't send them work. And if they're doing shitty work, tell them they're doing shitty work. So it's the, none of this molly cuddling stuff. You know, we have to be very, uh, we, we have to be better in everything. I, and I also, thank you. I also brought up another point when you were speaking, I wanted to touch upon it for calling, you know, calling the Armenians to engage with certain Arab countries. Can you explain how we could go about doing so and 
what the real benefit there is to doing so and what these Arab countries demand and receive in return for such a political engagement with us? It's not political. First of all, if, if you go to the Gulf, I mean, the, first of all, there's a million different kinds of Arab countries, to be honest with you. And if, if you only knew some of the businesses that Armenians from here do in places like Iraq and Syria, you know, you can write books about them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, essentially, I'll give you some of the backstory. The Armenian cigarette firms took over all the Western ones when ISIS took over because they were the only ones willing to work to do work in ISIS territory. So right now, every year, Armenia exports like three, four hundred million dollars worth of cigarettes to Iraq every year. It flies there every morning. Don't even ask me how this came about. But apparently what they did is uh, if you, you could be a Christian that stayed in ISIS territory as long as you paid a head tax. So they found all these Iraq highs and Syria highs that would stay in different places. And so they would bribe, bribe ISIS. So they took this entire business away from the Marlboros and the Winstons of the world. So trust me, <laughs> when it comes to stuff like that, you know, they essentially pushed Winston and Marlboro and all these guys out of that market. Interesting. Now they all smoke Gardney and Akhtam and <laughs> stuff like that. So uh, we're wheeler, I mean, wheeler dealer traders anyway. Now, if you go to the Gulf countries, Abu Dhabi and places like that, I mean, those are trading centers. People come from all over the world. And there's already a good amount of that happening. One of the reasons you have these odd flying hours is because every morning at four or 5 a.m., the best choice tomatoes and vegetables from Ayastang actually gets shipped to Qatar and Qatar Airways. Uh, that's why you have that weird time frame. I mean, all the flights here are weird, but that, that's even more weird. But you know, right. that's, that's the way they work. So we have this obsession with, uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, this Western obsession about selling things to what different, I mean, what would you rather do? I mean, you look at all the EE program, EU programs to give people, you know, to raise snails to sell them to France or raspberries to Germans. Well, wouldn't it be better to sell our computer services to the uh, Emiratis? Which one's better? Which one pays more? Exactly. So we have to get away from this idea that, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't sell raspberries to the Germans. That's not the issue. I'm just saying you don't have to be just that. Right. You can broaden your horizons. You can look in other places that, yeah, they look different. They got different cultures, but so what? So do the Chinese and we do a lot of business with them. So you have to look East, you have to look South and don't yeah. have any, get over these stupid, silly prejudices that we're somehow better than these people. Because frankly, they've got much more functional economies and countries than we do, no matter what other advantages that they have. Uh, I mean, you, you can't fly to any of these places and say they're underdeveloped. You right. Know? Right. Uh, or, or the, I mean, you compare, for example, Qatar, which yeah. has great gas resources to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has an economy that is 90% 90, 90 of its income comes from one thing. If you go to the Gulf countries, they have, they have manufacturing, they have a thousand different things. And trust me, they're hardly the model of democracy or anything that you want. They're horrible states to do horrible things. That's not even an issue. Right. right. But uh, this notion that, you know, we have to beg and borrow to be, you know, to deal with Europeans. You can, you can trade with the whole world. And I we've done that. For, we've done that for centuries, centuries. Yeah. True. Uh, okay. Now moving on. Um, my last couple of questions have to do with, again, this notion that the world went silent. So, we have all heard that war crimes were committed against the Armenian people by the Azeri forces and their Turkish supporters, as well as the jihadist mercenaries. What specifically are these war crimes? And second, have these war crimes been documented by independent authorities, such as reputable human rights organizations and or NG other NGOs? Azerbaijan claims that Armenian forces committed atrocities as well. Is there evidence of this? The simple question is then, if any war crimes were committed, then how is it that to all of us, it appears that the world is silent on this matter. The world is silent on this matter because our lives don't matter. We need to, we need to understand that. We need to embrace that. We live or we die, we do not matter to people. We live or we die, we matter as much as Haitians living or dying or people in Senegal or people in El Salvador. Let's get that through our heads, okay? We only matter when we make ourselves important enough to matter. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for a hundred years, you know, I hear from very, uh, the world is silent again. Well, yeah, guess what? It, they're going to be silent again if we don't, uh, we don't make ourselves more important. More relevant? More relevant in the world. I mean, you think that if, for example, 15, 20 years from now, we're doing business with a lot of, a lot more companies 
than are doing business here now. If you're closer to becoming a more developed country, there's more corporate interest to make sure bad things don't happen, okay? What's our impact on the world economy now? Cognac, you know, wine, and a start of a tech sector, but nowhere, you know, it's not in that scale yet for it to matter to everyone. So we need to get over this idea that they're gonna care and they're gonna rescue us. No one's gonna rescue us. No one cares if we live or die, okay? It's a shitty, horrible world. Just let's get that to work. Don't expect other people to do things for us. They're not gonna do right. things for us. Uh, and uh, our lives don't matter. And we learned that. We learned that the hard way. Listen, living here, those 44 days were hard. Uh, I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Mm. I can tell you the, the worst day in peace better than the best day in war. Yeah. So, uh, and we had that fear that, you know, that sort of that existential fear. But, you know, I, I said this in another show, we should thank these countries for telling us where we stand with them. Because if we know that we don't, we can't be saved. And if we know that they don't care if we live or die, then you know what, you act accordingly. Yeah. And when you're strong enough and they come to you and ask you a favor, you can give them the middle finger. Right. Exactly. So let's grow up. So true. Um, so just going back just to this war crimes, you don't even see it as breaking the cycle of impunity if such a process doesn't happen. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to respond That's to that. No, I asked you. I went, on a, I went on a rampage. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the war crimes were systematic. They were intentional. Right. Uh, and the Western uh, human rights organizations have been negligent for exactly the same reason that I just outlined earlier. And there's also this problem that a lot of these Western NGOs, frankly, are, we don't fit their uh, list of approved victims, okay? Because list of approved victims are not supposed to be Christians and they're not supposed to look Caucasian, okay? Mm. Uh, if we, we, you know, we were Muslims or something else, if you were a Kosovar, you know, the whole world would be up in arms, okay? So we don't, we're not the approved list of victims, okay? So that's, that's part of the problem, mm. but it was systematic. The only Azeri claims of war crimes would be rocket attacks on a couple of their cities in which they, were, they hit civilian areas, but it's nothing compared to systematic torture, killing, beheadings, sending you know, text photos of people that were beheaded. The, the, this is not the moral equivalency. That is, we need to be very careful of this Western moral equivalency Right. And I'll tell you what this is, because it's, it's driven by racist ideas about us, because they see us as, you know, why can't these people get along? You know, it's these little, you know, little brown people that keep fighting each other. Why can't they be like the Finns and the Swedes? And well, you know what? Because our neighbors are not the Finns and the Swedes. Right. They don't want to get that through their thick heads. OK, so we need we shouldn't play into it. Uh, however, we on our side, with some exceptional people like Artak uh, Beglarian from Arta, have done an exceptional job of documenting this. Mm -hmm. And I think over the next months or years, we need to prosecute Azerbaijan in the court of public opinion and force everyone to look at these things and shove it down everyone's throat, whether they want to or not. But I will not, I don't know. I'll, I'll give you something that, that should shock you. The only, up until two days ago, where war crimes against our soldiers were, I think it was Human Rights Watch or someone that said, talked about mistreatment of our soldiers. Up until that point, there was only been one country or one person that had denounced war crimes against Armenian soldiers. You know who that was and what country that was? It was the foreign ministry spokesman of Iran. <laughs> the foreign ministry spokesman of Iran, when asked about the beheadings, said that this is barbaric and it does not, it has nothing to do with Islam or Islamic practices. So up all of these, you know, these fantastic hypocritical Western organizations didn't say a word. It took the, the, a country and a spokesperson that's hardly, you know, right. a standard for human rights treatment of its own people to state the obvious. So uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people are turned against the West, it's not necessarily the, the government, it's the coverage and it's the attitude that they have towards us. And, and uh, we get that. I mean, we're, we're not approved victims, okay? Uh, you, you read the international press, it's horrendous. It's always this two sides thing. 
You know, there is no two sides here. You can't, there's no moral equivalency from some one side that's trying to commit genocide and another side that's trying to prevent it. Now, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we haven't done bad, that we don't have faults or that's not, I'm not, you know, we're not, this right. is not 100% one way or the other. However, it doesn't take any kind of a moral genius to figure out who the, uh, the aggressor is here and who's the victim. Yes. Um, I am sadly going to have to share you with our audience now, but before I do, I just wanted to ask as an American Armenian, what can we do more than be visible and militant? I know you've spoken about that, but how can we actually make a real difference and in influence in politics in U.S. politics about this? Well, I mean, listen, uh, a lot of it really depends on the audience and, and who's listening. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I've sort of given up my partisan uh, allegiances to be honest with you, but I think we have an administration now that's slightly more, uh, slightly more likely to listen. We have some things going for us in the West at this point, because I think there's an element of, of shame or actually that they're angry that this whole issue got away from them and it's all the Russians and the Turks and all that. So there's gonna be greater Western involvement in these talks and negotiations anyway. And I think the US will be part of that. Uh, but I, I, what I would say is, is engagement on a, on a lobbying level that is far more uh, based on practical results and not symbolism, okay? It needs to be very specific things. Uh, they don't negotiate in good faith. How do we move to uh, recognition? How do we look at remedial secession, which is a, a UN standard, but that could easily apply to Artsakh, which was applied to Kosovo, in which if there's a minority within a larger country and they're being targeted for genocide, you can actually legally go in there and take that country apart, uh, take that part of the country and create something independent. This is how Kosovo came about. So it needs to be something that is uh, systematic and not based on symbolism. You don't want a, a resolution. None of that shit matters. You want solid things. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, is to use US laws, uh, human rights and other things to litigate, essentially do whatever we do, except do more of it, do it more effectively. And then don't be focused on silly symbolisms of got this it. resolution, that resolution. It's like, it's got, you gotta have some concrete results Perfect. and there's gotta be consequences for their actions. Very helpful, thank you. I'm gonna ask, now turn it over to our audience and I'm gonna ask a couple questions on behalf of our audience yeah. members, Eric. So Harut asks, how, you see, how do you see Armenia's relation with Iran going forward? The way Iran acted during the course of this war sent complex and contradictory messages to Armenia. Well, I'll tell you this much. Uh, unlike the Russians who do things and then they sort of leak it and signal it, the Iranians do things and they never leak it and they never signal it. Uh, we will not know what the Iranians did or didn't do uh, during this war. Uh, I can tell you, I suspect that they were more helpful <laughs> than, uh, than it appears on paper. There were some very odd things that were going on. They they were shooting down an abundant number of Azeri drones and I don't think all of them were flying over Iran. Uh, so, uh, and it was clear that the stuff that was being, a lot of our resupplies were either being flown over Iran or there's a lot of speculation was actually coming through Iran from people, reporters that were there and they saw lines of stuff coming off of, you know, uh, in that road from Iran to Papan. So. We will never know what they did. I can tell you they were quite happy with the status quo and they didn't want that changed. But uh, this country has always underplayed its relationship with Iran. Not that Iran is a perfect partner of any kind and it's underplayed its uh, uh, relationship because of Western interests. Mm -hmm. And at this point, uh, I don't see what, what's, what the moral claim they have to tell us Right. Who we should have relationships, who we should have trades with when it when it mattered. Whatever you say about the Iranians, they didn't do anything against us. And you know, ironic, they, I think there are 13, there's more Azeris living in Iran, right, than in Azerbaijan. Yeah, I mean, they're not, I mean, they didn't close, I mean, the, the Georgians were given all kinds of transportation right. problems, slowing things down. Everything came through Iran, no problems. Uh, they, 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 
what they helped us, we don't know. We probably won't know for years. What they, what they, they did not act against us, that's for sure. Great. Ruzan asks, you mentioned that in the war, there was only one decision maker, Erdogan. If this is so, how could Putin stop the war in the moment when Azerbaijan was winning big? Doesn't this indicate that Putin was also one of the showrunners? What kind of leverage no, does he have? I think it means that most likely uh, Putin draw, uh, most likely, again, we don't know this. I'm just speculating. Right. Because right. frankly, they could have, if they would have come through and surrounded our, our you know, trapped our army, they could have done what they've always wanted, which was to clear our top of all our means. We were this close to that. People need to understand that. Listen, you can blame Pashinyan for a million things, but these people who are saying he shouldn't have signed the ceasefire when he did uh, are, are uh, delusional. I don't care what you think of him. You think that there was a better deal before. But on that moment, if I was the prime minister, if you were the prime minister, if Serge Sarkisian was the prime minister, whether it's the, you know, the taxi driver was the prime we're all going to do the same thing. Right. Because that decision was, you sign this, and or if you don't sign it, uh, you're going to have 2,500 years of Armenian life in Artsakh be wiped out within days. So that was the only decision. People need to understand that. So you can blame them for a thousand things. These people demonstrating in Glendale for the continuation of the war. I'm sorry, your kids aren't the ones fighting it. Mm -hmm. And two, that was the only decision to make. As horrendous and horrific as that decision was, and no person would ever want to be making that decision because your name will be darkened with that for all of history, okay? But at some point as a leader, even if you're, whatever criticisms you have of him, he did what he was supposed to do, which is not commit suicide as a nation. So we need to be, we need to be clear about that. I think what happened, if, I'm, if I was to guess, there was a line in which the Russians were not going to let happen. The, the Russians would have looked horrendously horrible. And I think there was also a French action there because there was a lot of conversations between Putin and uh, Macron right in those days, where they were not going to allow that to happen. That images of these people being driven out, hundreds of thousands of them, of this land that they've lived on for 2000 years was not something that is going to be too horrific uh, for them to just for their image uh, to put up with. And also just from a cynical, practical point of view, there's no Armenians in Artsakh. There's no Russian presence in Artsakh. So there's no Armenians, there's no Russians. So uh, at some point he could have just said, you know what, uh, you, you can't go any further because we'll have to do other things if that's the case. I, I, if I was to guess, that would be the only reason. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, all of these, both, no matter what the hell Erdogan did, Erdogan kept the war going. But if Angela Merkel would have ever called Erdogan and said, you call off this war, or I'm going to put uh, sanctions on the lira, Erdogan would have ended the war two days after it started. Okay. Uh, same thing with Donald Trump. If you would have called him and threatened him with, with some kind of economic sanction, they would have stopped the war immediately. That the key thing to understand is Erdogan could do this because we were not important for other, other people enough. We were not important enough for other people to call in their chits for us. Angela Merkel was never going to make that call because we're not important to her. Donald Trump was never going to make that call because we're not important to her. At the end of the day, we were important enough for Putin's reputation that he put a stop to it. Okay. Another question. Um, that's a long. Uh, Michael Rubin, after just returning from Artsakh on December 3rd at the National Interest, outlined how the next caucus war would start, with Turkey instigating a direct or hybrid war on Armenia, same as it did at northern Syria to occupy Zangasur. Turkey has amassed now 50,000 troops on Armenia's border at Igdir. How do you assess this possibility, and what do you think Russia's response might be? I don't think there's any possibility of that. I think that's all. Uh, I, I know, I know Ruben, actually, I have a lot of respect for him. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm, he's quite pro-Armenian and I have a lot of respect for him. He was in Artsakh. Uh, but I think this, uh, the Russian guarantee of, Ar of Armenia proper security is quite solid. Everybody knows that. And, and no one's got to cross that line. Uh, so I'm not, uh, that was never an issue. Uh, and, and I think this bringing troops to the border and all that stuff, it's, that's, that's, that's him being 
really, really angry for being thrown under the bus and doing all of this work for nothing. All he got out of this was the stupid office and this parade that he's going to oversee on the 10th. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is like the National Geographic version of pol in geopolitics. You know, it was the Karabakh was the, you know, Arsakh is the gazelle. The hyenas, which are the Turks, the Azeris, and the terrorists brought it down, and the lion came and ate it. Okay? This, this is what happened. If you want to know the National Geographic version, this is what happened. So when the lion showed up and actually, you know, put his paws down, yeah. uh, the hyenas went away. Because at the end of the day, uh, the lion has nuclear weapons. They don't. And so that goes great with the next question. I think it is apparent the main argument from the opposition side is that the so-called color revolution in 2018 being seen as a pro-West, pro-Europe push, steering Armenia away from its long relationship with Russia was a deterrent to the country and a major reason as to why this war happened when it did and why we had the outcome we did with no direct mil Russian military involvement. What are your thoughts on this? And do you believe this would have played out in a different way if Serge Sarkisian or the old regime were still in power? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, in 2016, uh, this, the same scenario happened, except during that time, the Russians had far more influence in Azerbaijan and Turks had not. So the war ended very quickly. In fact, in 2016, Aleyev himself wanted to end the war after three days because he just wanted some show of force and grab some land and then call it a day. Uh, I, I think this is sort of a, okay, let's put it you this way. Uh, the country for 20 years was dying, okay? Uh, it was a hopeless place. Everyone was trying to leave. Uh, uh, so I, I don't see how, the, in, in, and plus a revolution that had probably 90% support from people at, at the time that it happened. So it was almost universal. Uh, as far as are we being punished for that? The Russian reaction, okay, let's look at the Russian reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Putin is not a child. Whatever he thinks of Pashinyan, you don't make geopolitical decisions based on, I like this person, I don't like this person. This is not, it's not high school, okay? Uh, Pashinyan had done some stupid things with Putin, but at the end of the day, he put his top diplomat, again, one of the top diplomats in the world, and he hammered out a deal. They sat people down, Putin himself was on the phone, and they hammered out a deal over seven hours in a normal setting without Turkish influence, this war would have ended on October 10th with much better outcome for us. So this notion that he uh, wanted to punish us for this revolution. Well, let's look at, let's look at the realities of this post-revolution. No matter all of Pashinyan's mistakes, he never openly took a position that the Russians opposed. He never tried to join NATO. He never tried to get out of that silly economic union that they have. He never tried to uh, apply to the EU. He, what the Russians care about, and this is the thing that people don't understand. People think that the Russians are very intrusive. They're actually not. The Americans are far more intrusive in South Central America than the Russians are in this part of the world. What the Russians don't want, the Russians think that they're on the defensive and that they're surrounded. They don't want you to be openly hostile against them, and i.e. try to line up in these Western military alliances. As long as you do that, they could care less what you do internally as far as cleaning up, going after the oligarchs and all of these things. They could care less about any of that. So I think that's that question, the case for that this is the color revolution that leads to it is a rather weak one, just based on the way that the Russians acted. Mm -hmm. uh, because they did try to shut this thing down fairly quickly. They did not want this to get out of hand. And I can tell you, ultimately they were not happy with this result. And it also humiliated them because essentially Armenia is part of uh, their defense systems in a way that they're used Russian weapons and Russian systems and a lot of Russian training. So they didn't look good coming out of this. So I, I don't think that argument has total validity. Does that might, 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 does it have some things on the edges that it could possibly, but I think just look at the way they acted. I don't think that's the case. Okay. Thank you. Zavin is asking, at the public rally of this evening four hours ago, the call was for Pashinyan to retire peacefully with a deadline of Tuesday, December 8th noon to have Vazgen Manukyan become the interim government leader for one year to conduct new parliamentary elections after new reforms. How would you assess that such a peaceful transition may occur? And what could be the reactions of Russia and Turkey? 
Turkish reaction. Turkish reaction. Turkish reaction doesn't matter. Uh, the Russians uh, do not want Pashinyan to leave, not because they love Pashinyan, because the Russians are, are hell bent on implementing this deal. Uh, that solidifies their position there. And repeatedly, every time someone has said something against Pashinyan, and this is mostly targeted at Armin Sarkisian, they immediately turn around and Putin throws Pashinyan a timeline, a lifeline saying how good you know, he, he made the only decision. You know, people are wrong about him and this and this and this. So the foreign issue is not there. In truth, this opposition that's on the street has absolutely no credibility. Uh, you know, the biggest demonstration we've had here is about 5,000 people, which in the scale of Armenia is nothing. We're used to five figures here when people are serious. Mm -hmm. This is the reality. People, the, the average person here sees two choices a not very, comp, not very competent Pashinyan government that has a disastrous war result with an opposition on the street that is for the most part, some of the worst elements of the old regime. And if that's the choice, this, the incompetence of Pashinyan will beat their corruption. Now, uh, so this deadlines and things are silly. First of all, for legal purposes, Pashinyan has a mandate for another three years, unless his party wants him to leave. It's a parliamentary system. He can stay for another three years and there could be another election. Now, I'm not, I don't support that at all. I think you, you need to have, at a minimum, he needs to broaden his government dramatically and bring in a lot of people that are new, more competent, technocratic, uh, he needs to, he does not, you know, he won a 70% mandate. He does not have a 70% mandate now. So you either have elections uh, five, six months from now, or you go into some kind of a much broader government that reflects a lot more opinions uh, and, and opin opinions of people that were against you. But I think it's key for any change like this to make sure that it does not become the road for the old regime to come back or their elements to come back. And, uh, I think unless, until there is a force, there's some kind of a political grouping that is not Pashinyan, but not tied to the old regime, I don't see him going anywhere because uh, people don't want that old regime back. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, um, from Armin, a follow-up question from Armin is, should we attempt to propose a deal to Turkey where Armenia would exchange the lower part of Armenia for Hars and Ardagan region to, of Turkey to enable access to the Black Sea for Armenia and then for Turkey to access Azerbaijan directly? Well, I mean, uh, anything of that nature would, uh, you think Pashinyan is being killed now. <laughs> anything that cuts off trade with Iran and or a direct line with Iran would would be seen as a disastrous betrayal and that would never happen anyway. It's just not, uh, it's good It's good for a board game, but it's not, it doesn't Got work it. in real life. Got it. Um, okay. Um, another question is, oh, a private question. Should President Sarkisian have a bigger role? Well, first of all, he accepted to be president, which is sort of like being king, you know. Yeah. Uh, so he gets, you know, he gets to do all the fun things. He signs bills. He can have ice cream with kids that knock on his door. He doesn't have to make any of the hard decisions. So now, you know, he obviously wants to become prime minister, and he's doing sort of a trying to do a parliamentary coup, and it's sort of failing, because in a parliamentary system, unless you flip members of Pashinyan's own party, you can't come to power. Other than you know, unless he resigns or his party decides to pick somebody else. Parliamentary systems are very close. They have a mandate, they have a majority, they have a huge majority. He can probably lose 15 members and he can still stay in power. So uh, should, he, should he have a bigger role? Yeah, I think a lot of people like him should have a bigger role, but this is also raw politics. You know, when you, when you try to kill the king and you don't kill the king, you're less, less of a player and he's not gonna sit and make you part of his inner circle after you, you try to overthrow him and take his job. Right. Okay, um, our, mem our uh, Manugyan asks, the OSCE put into place an arms embargo in 1992, banning the sales and transfer of weapons or things that can be converted to be used in the Harabakh region. Can we get this embargo enforced as well as punish those who have violated, violated it in the form of compensation to the Armenians and Azeris, as well as stipulate that an arms balance needs to be restored in the region? No, because the, the arms business and the people who make money from it uh, have far more power relevance than any of these city rules that nobody follows. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that the arms business where 
Uh, it's like right up there with the prostitution as one of the oldest industries. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of it. And, and all of those rules are there to be broken. Uh, and no one ever gets punished. There's too many people involved in making too much money. And uh, uh, consequences of people like us being hurt, we don't think it doesn't matter. And he also asks, Araman again also asks, thank you, Eric. Um, Turkey produces a laser defense weapon that is capable of shooting down drones, incoming projectiles, and disabling tanks, which have been used in Libya and Syria on August 2019 to shoot down drones. Classified report by the Army's National Ground Intelligence Center produced in 1999 noted that laser weapons or lasers with weapons capabilities can be purchased from Russia, China, and Armenia. Turkey has laser weapons. Why is it that Armenia has failed to produce similar weapons, which would have countered the drone issue? We spoke about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, it's not, first of all, I'm not, I'm not an expert on weapon systems and I don't right. know anything about it. And if I don't know something, I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Give opinions on something that I don't know. However, listen, it's not, uh, it's a total failure on our part not to develop this industry earlier. We actually have drones, by the way. We actually have suicide drones, but they never managed to purchase them or make them in large quantities. There's actually an Armenian company that builds them. There's a level of lack of thinking where you uh, like, uh, you wonder like, uh, you know, there's this beautiful new defense building that looks like the Armenian Pentagon, you know, on top of the hill, beautiful building. You just wonder like what the hell they did there for 10 years or 20 years, uh, except, you know, have build prettier offices. <laughs> uh, the level of the level of uh, un, the, le the level of lack of thinking and incompetence uh, is uh, remarkable. So yeah, these are all good questions, but it's just more dysfunction of a dysfunctional country that has systematic failures on many important fronts. Okay. Will there be any repercussions? Do you feel for what? to Turkey, to human rights, any of this? Hell no. Nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was, only, what? I mean, I gotta tell you what, the lesson that people have learned here is you get your own illegal weapons and you use it the next time because it doesn't matter anyway. How come, you know, that people don't complain about cluster bombs here. They go, how come we don't have cluster bombs? <laughs> Good to know. What was Israel's role in this war, asks Harold, other than selling arms to Azerbaijan for money? Selling Azerbaijan, well, selling Azerbaijan arms for money and keeping a very strong resupply going to the extent they actually, there's an article in the Asia Times in which the, uh, an unnamed Israeli source actually says that they, the Israelis could not have kept this pace of war going without their constant resupplies because, you know, a lot of their drones were being shot down. We shot down a lot of their drones. Uh, in fact, you know, the Israeli weapon systems were far less of a problem than the Turkish ones. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the Tavush fighting, one of the things that our guys were able to do is actually to hijack their operating systems of the Israeli drones. They actually stole them from the air and landed them on the Armenian side. So the Israeli weapon systems were uh, relevant, uh, but the Turkish weapon systems were more relevant, to be honest. But they were constantly being resupplied. I mean, there was this constant flow of resupply coming in through Israel, Turkey, and even other, other countries, Pakistan, Ukraine, Listen, the whole world was against us. Let's just be clear about this. You know, everybody made a buck off of this and we had no friends. You know, they have friends, we have acquaintances. Yeah. What's that? Ardem just asked, is there a way to get the billions taken back from individuals in the past leadership? Uh, not really. I mean, it's uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Cities like London and uh, many other, you know, Swiss cities are essentially, you know, it's just a prettier face of the mafia as far as how they launder money and they cover up for all the theft that's stolen from many countries like Armenia and much places with much more wealth than Armenia. Mm -hmm. So there's this entire Western industry that's designed to, uh, 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 you know, uh, loot, rob and rape countries like Armenia and have people making $500 uh, an hour cover up for it and make a very good living off of it and take really nice vacations at our expense. Hmm. Um, Ruzan asks, based on Russian media, Russians were happy when the war started. 
In particular, Margarita Simonian from Russia today said something like Armenia has either to return to Russia or cease from existing. Since Russia has no free press, don't you think this indicates that Russia was one of the was one of the instigators of the war? No. That's right, Margarita Simonian is an idiot. <laughs> so uh, you know, listen, there's this tendency. There's a thing you have to understand about Russia. Yes, the country has only one decision maker that matters, okay? But in a country that fast, that one decision maker cannot control everyone and everything. Uh, Russian public opinion uh, throughout the war actually swung in our direction by the end of it. And Russian public opinion does matter because even in places that aren't democratic, public opinion has some role. In fact, the people that were most skeptical of Russian involvement on our behalf were people who were the quote unquote liberals in Russia who felt Armenia was being too nationalist and we got ourselves into this trouble. There's, there's, there's this tendency to read too much into what RT says or does or Margarita Simonian, you know, she's always said these provocative things and she sort of pushes the envelope. But, you know, uh, no matter what you say about Russia, it's a serious country and they don't make policy decisions on, on silly milly comments by you know, idiot reporters. Okay, great. Is there anything you'd like to state before we wrap it up? Um, uh, very simple, don't give into cynicism. I'm not saying be naive, be, be engaged, find your little niche and do your part. Don't fall into this uh, cynicism of doing nothing and and be feeling happy about it because oh it's difficult or whatever. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, there's ridiculous histrionics, uh, you know, uh, uh, especially in, in Southern California about what's going on here. People are unhappy. It's, it's not a happy place. Uh, you know, everybody knows someone who died, but it's not as chaotic as people in LA think this place is. And life goes on. It's a political crisis, but it isn't like people are fighting each other on the streets and beating each other up. We're actually handling it quite in a civilized manner. Uh, so, uh, and don't give in to this ridiculous rumor mongering, this idiotic, you know, things, questions that I get uh, from all kinds of very intelligent people asking silly things about, you know, uh, this conspiracy, that conspiracy. Uh, Let's that look goes at the with facts. also. Does that also just sorry to interrupt? But that was now. Ever since I said we're wrapping up, I got twelve more questions. But um, does that also go with the sabotaging the this conspiracy that perhaps the um, war efforts were sabotaged by high-ranking military men? Okay. Uh, listen, treachery is part of warfare. Is it mm -hmm. possible that treachery happened? I'm almost certain it happened. Okay. Treachery happens in every war. We know of units from the NSA, the National Security Service, that refuse to fight. R.A. Karatunian has talked about it. It wasn't even a secret, okay? Why? Nobody knows. So is it cowardice? Nobody knows. So were there villainous things that happened? Yeah, but villainous things happen in the war that we won, okay? So you, you cannot look at these things, you know, you have to look at it systematically. What are the systematic failures? It's systematic failures that win or lose wars, not individual actions by one, you know, one coward here or one idiot there. You know, uh, you put 50,000 people in the front, 5,000 of them are going to be crazy. You know, 2,000 of them are going to be treacherous, but so what? Then you have, you know, 10,000 of them that are heroic or are very smart. So, and we need to not talk about things that we don't know. And a, we need to have humility. Let's not talk about things we do not know. Let's not start silly rumors that you have, if you can't back it up, don't say it. Uh, you know, you, there's things about World War II that we we found out 10 years ago. So this notion that you're going to know exactly what happened in each uh, front and, and all the, it, it, this, this loss, this war was not because of individual acts of treachery, despite the fact that I'm sure there were individual acts of treachery. Mm -hmm. Wars are won or lost on much broader systematic setups of how you do things. Excellent. There is so much positive commentary about you on the chat and I'm getting on my texts. I think uh, the best comment is uh, to sum it up. Uh, God bless you, Eric. And oh, <laughs> thank you. 
Thank you. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. But I really want to thank you, Eric Hagopian, for taking these hard questions. And to all of you for watching and engaging. Thank you from me, Ani Shahbazian, and the whole team here at the ARFA Institute in solidarity. Bye. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Ani.